Committee hearing on the crisis on our southern border will come to order. Um, welcome, everybody. Without objection, uh, I'll declare a recess at any time. Mr. Timmons, Mr. Ed Edwards, and Mr. Siskiani uh, are waved down to the hearing for the purpose of participating in today's hearing. I'll, uh, first of all, before we begin, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll start with Mr. Siskiani and go across because you guys don't know who they are. Just identify yourself with your state. Sure. Well, hi, everyone. Juan Siskamani, I'm your congressman. Good to see you all again. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Congressman William Timmons from Greenville and Spartanburg of South Carolina, 4th Congressional District. Great to be here. Glenn Groth, and I'm from Wisconsin along Lake Michigan. Andy Biggs uh, from Arizona's 5th Congressional District, and it's great to be down here in Cochise County. Good afternoon. I'm Chuck Edwards, North Carolina's 11th Congressional District. Thank you for all your interest. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Okay, we'll, we'll do this just like any other hearing. Um, I'll recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. Um, I am the subcommittee chairman of the National Security and Border and Foreign Affairs Committee. Good afternoon and welcome to our joint subcommittee hearing on how the Biden administration's immigration policies have impacted border communities and communications across the country. I want to th thank my colleague Andy Biggs, who has arranged frequent hearings, uh, or for at least frequent tours, of the southern border for congressmen from around the country. And I'd like to thank him for his leadership on this issue, on this issue and his willingness to join in this hearing. I want to thank my colleagues for making the time to fly out here to learn more about this issue with me. It couldn't be more appropriate that we're here in the Tucson sector because the Border Patrol apprehended over, over 40,000 illegal immigrants in the month of July alone. That's the highest it's been in 15 years. Even though not all of us are representing southwest border states, this illegal immigration impacts any, every community in the United States. The Biden administration continues to lean into failed policies that cause a catastrophe on our southwest border. It's a, it's a problem that requires oversight. Under this majority, the House Oversight Committee has, this will be our fifth hearing, uh, the fourth on this subcommittee alone, on border issues. We've conducted seven transcribed interviews with chief patrol agents from sectors along the southwest border, and we've sent many demands for documents and information to the Department of Homeland Security and other relevant agencies to provide transparency. We intend to understand why the crisis at our southern border is only getting worse, even as more and more taxpayer dollars are committed to the humanitarian and security response. And something I'm reluctant to point out, but will point out, None of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have decided to join us today, uh, despite an open invitation to participate. And I'll point out right now I'm on another special committee dealing with the drug side of this thing, the, um, the drug cartel side of this thing. Uh, at least we're invited to come down to Arizona le next, uh, later this month. Same thing. We haven't been able to get any Democrats to come down here. When I get around my district again and again, I hear, why can't you guys try to work together? And we just have a complete lack of sense of urgency. And I'll tell you from being down here and talking to so many in the past, you cannot know what's going on on the southern border unless you've been here and talked to the people who live it, both law enforcement, ranchers, what have you. Um, Despite uh, President Biden claiming that his administration would, big would bring transparency and truth back to the government to share the truth, even when it's hard to hear, the Biden administration has tried to hide the truth from the American people when it comes to our border security and the crisis they've engineered. By the way, I'd like to thank, we have a few members of the press back there, and I'm really glad to see that because we do need this being covered to alert uh, the American public. Disclosures made in litigation between the Biden administration in Florida and Texas show at least 2 million illegal aliens have been released into the United States under the Biden administration. I am sure that is low. In fiscal year 2023 through June, Customs and Border Protection personnel have encountered 2.3 million inadmissible aliens at the ports of entry and between ports of entry, almost as many encountered in the entire fiscal year 2022. So in other words, 
with two months to go, we've already cleared what we did last year. Additionally, the CPB One smartphone app was created and launched in 2020 during the pandemic to facilitate lawful trade and travel for those with legitimate business before the agency. The Biden administration now used CPB One app to let hundreds of thousands of inadmissible aliens into the country, overwhelming officers at the points of entry, and leaving vulnerabilities in our national security. In other words, what's going on, the... Uh, the Border Patrol that expected and was hired to guard the border has to deal with paperwork at the points of entry instead, which is why you have such big gaps. The Biden administration's propaganda machine calls these unlawful pro parole programs lawful pathways. Make no mistake, these so-called lawful pathways are anything but lawful and are a complete abuse of limited parole authority provided under the Immigration and National Nationality Act statute. When the Biden administration isn't actively breaking our immigration laws, they pretend that everything is fine, repeating the tired rhetoric that they've created a safe, orderly, humane immigration system. That is not true. Look further than, look no further than how the Biden administration has mismanaged an influx of unaccompanied alien children, many who have been subject to horrible abuses by unrelated sponsors who traffic them into forced labor to pay off smuggling debts, and by unaccompanied children children coming across without an adult. That's eight to 10,000 every month across this border. Unbelievable. Earlier this year, I chaired a national security subcommittee hearing where the Office of Refugee Resettlement director testified about their work to assist unaccompanied alien children. It was clear the Biden administration prioritized speed over safety and failed to properly screen sponsors to assist in temporary care for unaccompanied minors. It was clear that the unaccompanied minors coming into the country face enormous pressure to work illegal full-time jobs to support either themselves, their families abroad, or to pay off debts to cartels or their sponsor. I want to emphasize, who may or may not hear it today, that a lot of times these people come across, they are obligated by the drug cartels who let them in here to have to pay eight to $20,000 for that trip, which is just unbelievable. It was clear that employees and contractors who raised alarm bells were retaliated against and silenced. Countless children, and I say countless because the administration couldn't keep track of tens of thousands of these children, are now being exploited across our country as a direct result of the chaos at the border. It's vital that the Biden administration continues to take steps to deter illegal immigration and reduce the impact of human trafficking on vulnerable children. Today, we'll explore how the Biden administration's immigration policies have affected our border communities in the nation. Our witnesses today will discuss how the reversal of deterrent-focused illegal immigration policies have had an adverse effect on American security, business, and livelihoods. We'll also hear from experts on the big picture issues created by the Biden administration immigration policies and how these decisions have implications for the future of our immigration policy. I'd like to thank everyone who traveled from near and far to get here and to address this issue, which in my opinion is the number one issue in the United States right now. I look forward to your testimonies today. And now I'd like to rec recognize the chair of the Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime and Federal Government Surveillance, Mr. Biggs, for the purpose of making his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is really an honor to be here. And um, the, I want to start by saying that this is an official congressional committee hearing. This is not some, some forum or something like this. This is an official congressional hearing. And um, that makes it more um, curious that no one from the other side of the aisle chose to come to an official congressional hearing. It's very, very sad to me because this issue should not be a partisan issue. I also take this t opportunity to thank uh, Mayor Cleo Maka and uh, thank you for hosting us, Sierra Vista's mayor. Thank you for the president of Cochise College, J.D. Rot JD Rottweiler. Thank you for hosting it. Your staff has been excellent in putting this together because it is an official hearing. This is on C-SPAN. Uh, that's how you know it's official. Uh, we, if it's, if it's, if it's C-SPAN's not here, we're not here. So uh, we appreciate the, the college's staff and their great work. We appreciate Sheriff Daniels uh, and his deputies who've been um, 
uh, providing us with some good security, but also good information and in taking us to multiple places. Um, and I thank both of our other witnesses, uh, uh, Mr. Ladd, uh, who we've known for quite some time, and and he's a rancher here, and uh, um, Art Arthur, and his and his incredible um, knowledge that you're going to hear from. So there's a lot, a lot of people to thank. I thank our our, our U.S. Capitol Police uh, escort who's here with us as well, and we, of course we thank each and every one of you for your interest in coming here today. I'm pleased to be here in in this beautiful part of the world, and I crossed out so many things and added so many things. I'm trying to find where I got, where I'm supposed to be. Anyway, I'll just I'll just thank also my my co-chairman for this event, or this hearing, Mr. Grothman from Wisconsin. Mr. Grothman has been, I, I lead regular congressional delegations to the border, all over the border from RGV to Rio Grande Valley to, to uh, San Isidro, and which is San Diego. And he has been with me on at least, I think, half a dozen of those. So uh, he's a guy who knows and cares about this intensely. And my colleagues who are up here as well, I uh, appreciate them being here. See, I think it's really important to see what's really going on at the border. We can read about it, <clears throat> but, but the reality is until you see it, it doesn't, it doesn't strike home. You can watch videos on TV, but you just don't believe it. In fact, in fact, almost every time we post a video, there's always some yo-yo who says, that's a fake video, it's all staged. You know, it's remarkable to, to see. So when I visit the border, and when I'm... In my district in Arizona, I speak with Border Patrol agents, local law enforcement officials, concerned citizens, ranchers, businessmen and women. I want to know what's going on with them and what the impact is. Talk to sometimes education officials because you have recruitment going on by cartels of youth at schools through social media apps to come down and pick up people in Cochise County or on I-8 in Pinal County or down in Yuma to transport bodies for a thousand or two thousand bucks and take them on up to Phoenix or Tucson. So here's my report um, that that I want to give to you. I can say with certainty that the Biden border crisis and its effect on American communities is dangerous, is devastating, it demands national attention, it needs it immediately, and I call upon our colleagues to help us get whatever legislation needs to be uh, passed, passed. We've already passed H.R. 2. It's languishing in the Senate. It needs to be passed out of the Senate and signed by the President. It probably won't be. What needs to happen is enforcement, though. We need the executive branch to enforce the laws that are already on the books. If they begin doing that, we'll see a change uh, um, very quickly. DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas testified in front of the House Judiciary Committee just a couple of weeks ago. He doesn't believe there's a crisis. When we reminded him of what the Secure Fence Act of 2006 and how it defines operational control of the border, which basically says no person and no contraband can illegally cross into the United States of America, he said no one could do that. And thus, they had created their own definition. And according to his own definition, he's doing all right. I think that's impeachable. It is his reckless disregard for law and order and his implementation of open border policies that have caused the crisis that we see along the border and in the country. When we have open borders, we are not a secure nation. Here is one concerning recent example that we have received. We have received reports that criminal cartels are taking advantage of Secretary Mayorkas' open border policies. Secretary Mayorkas implemented the CBP-1 app to streamline, ostensibly to streamline, asylum appointments for migrants, allowing them to pre-register when they are near the U.S. border. Ostensibly, supposedly, there was geofencing that was going to be there. So that only when you got close to the border, which actually provides an incentive to come close to the border, but only when you got close to the border, then you could, then you could apply to CBP-1 to get that, that uh, uh, expedited appointment. Well, uh, that way he describes as being a lawful entryway. It's not lawful. It is not legal. There's no authority for that. But the even worse news is that cartels now are reportedly selling VPN services 
to migrants which allow them to pre-register for a U.S. asylum appointment and to ignore the geofencing system before they have even reached northern Mexico. These continue to be pull factors or incentives to come into this country illegally. The CBP-1 app hurts Americans by welcoming any migrant with a smartphone into the U.S. and assists the cartels in soliciting more customers to make the dangerous trip to our border. It is no wonder immigration numbers are again on the rise. Illegal. Don't conflate illegal immigration with legal immigration. The illegal border crossings continue to rise even though we've had a very hot summer. No one enters the border or crosses the border without the cartel's assistance and approval. Drugs are coming across and are literally poisoning our communities. It's time for this administration to stop enabling them and to enforce the law. The lives of victims of increased crime are at stake. You, in your, your community of Sierra Vista, there will be increased crime because there's increased drug use. In my community, uh, in Gilbert, yes, same thing. The lives of state and local law enforcement dealing with a continual rise in crime, their lives are at risk. At risk also are the lives of those in communities who live in fear of the violent crime and fentanyl pouring across our border and into their neighborhoods. The lives of the victims of known terrorists who've entered our open border due to lax screening, which by the way, the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security is now changing the, the, no, the categorization uh, nomenclature. It's no longer gonna be um, uh, on this terror watch list. It will be national security risk or something like that. Why? Why are you changing the language? Because it's easier to hide the reality of the gravity of the situation. Also, even the lives of, of those who are trying to get up here and cross illegally into the country. Many are dying en route. Many become, as, as uh, Chairman Grothman pointed out, indent effectively indentured servants to the cartels. But this administration is doing everything it can to encourage these people to make the journey by offering NGO assistance and simplifying and expanding lawful, lawful so-called lawful pathways. Secretary Mayorkas told Congress that DHS is, quote, taking it to the cartels, close quote. I wonder if he meant the profits for illegal drug and migrant activity. The only winners here are the cartels. We know these vast criminal networks are also facilitating human smuggling at the port border and are intentionally targeting the areas between the ports of entry. As Deputy Chief Justin De La Torre stated, quote, those organizations are deliberately placing them, the migrants, in the most remote regions of our area in order to pull our resources off of our patrol functions, close quote. The cartels have cashed in on these Biden policies like the mass parole and asylum applications that will take years to process, years where aliens remain in the United States awaiting a court appointment that they will not even ever attend. The last uh, time frame, and I, missed, I think Mr. Arthur's gonna clarify this probably for me, if I remember right, it's 84 months before people who are getting in today are getting court dates, 84 months out. The Biden administration is also falsely claiming border crossings are decreasing, but that's not, that's not really the truth. In 2023, encounters remain historically high. CBP personnel have already encountered 2.3 million inadmissible aliens at and in between the ports of entry. The figure doesn't even include the hundreds of thousands of gotaways who disappear completely into American communities and who are trying desperately to hide from the agents who would otherwise enforce the law. In 2022, 98 suspected terrorists were apprehended in between ports of entry. This year, it's over 140. The Tucson sector is no exception to the number of criminal migrants flowing across the border, as well as other criminal activity intercepted by the brave men and women under the leadership of Chief John Maudlin. Let me, let me just give you some recent numbers for the Tucson sector, of which that's where we're sitting in, the Tucson sector. Yesterday in the port of Nogales, this is at the port of entry, 870,000 fentanyl pills one day. 
port of entry, 870,000 pills. Last, not last week, week before last, more than 9,000 encounters in the Tucson sector. At Lukeville, just, just west of Lukeville, uh, two nights ago, 535 men in a single group apprehended. Weekend before last, just in, in three days, over 3,500 apprehensions. That is what's happening in our sector. And, and Sheriff Daniels and, and uh, Mr. Ladd are going to give us more information about th what they see on the ground here. The Tucson sector is leading in apprehensions. It has seen a 28% increase in apprehensions compared to last year. In the last week of July, as I said, more than 10,000 migrants during, the past, during that week. In that same week, agents also carried out, and you'll never hear this from the other side, 430 migrant rescues, 21 human smuggling attempts. They conducted 13 narcotic seizures, recovered one stolen vehicle and one firearm. And that's from the front lines. We invited our, our friends from the other side of the aisle to be here today. This is an official congressional hearing. We miss them. We wish they were here. We wish that they would say things like this is a serious nonpartisan or bipartisan issue instead of saying that this is all fantasy and this is hyperbole. It is not. The country's future is at stake. Thank you for being here. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, just one other thing. I just wanted to welcome uh, Gail Griffin from the uh, Arizona House of Representatives here today. Mr. Chairman, can, uh, can I recognize one other person? Uh, we have uh, a, a Senate majority staff from the state Senate, um, Kate Sawyer, who's here on behalf of Senator David Gallant. Thank you for being here, Kate. Okay. Um, I just, it just bugged me because I'm going to make one more point. I gave one through the opening statement. Don't ever let anybody tell you that America does not have an open door to immigrants who have to come here. Last year, over a million people were sworn into this country who came here legally. That's the highest it's been in over 15 years. So, Okay, now, pursuant to Committee Rule 9G, the witnesses will please stand and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. We appreciate all of you being here today and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that we've read your written statements and they will appear in full on the record. Uh, please try to limit, don't go that far over five minutes. I'll recognize Mr. Arthur for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Chair McGrothman. Chair, uh, Chair Biggs and members of the subcommittees, thank you for inviting me to, uh, today to discuss a topic crucial to our national security and communities across the nation. I was honored to serve in the federal government beginning in the George H.W. Bush administration in my 32 years of direct involvement in immigration. The southwest border has never been in such a crisis. Border Patrol agents here have apprehended more than 5.6 million illegal entrants since February of 2021, while CBP officers at the southwest border ports have encountered more than a half million more. Some 2.7 million of those aliens were expelled under Title 42, but that leaves 3.4 million others who were processed for removal under the Immigration Nationality Act. The fewer than 17,000 Border Patrol agents stationed at the southwest border have struggled to keep up with the migrant flow, and at times there have been just a handful of them to protect hundreds of miles of border. Consequently, more than 1.5 million other entrants have crossed the border illegally and made their way into the country scot-free. And tons of illegal drugs have flowed from Mexico into the United States, where they are hollowing out communities and killing record numbers of our fellow citizens. Listen to the administration's spokesman, and you'll hear that those migrants are coming in overwhelming border agents because of endemic factors, like poverty, crime, corruption, violence, and insecurity back home, as well as climate change and the lingering economic effects of the COVID pandemic. Such push factors do play some role, but as noted, most are endemic problems for many were much worse in the past. In truth, the main and driving reason that more than six million aliens have come to the southwest border in the past 30 months is, as a federal judge found in March, the reasonable expectation that the administration will release them into the country where they'll remain indefinitely 
if not forever. You see, rather than detaining aliens who cross illegally, as Congress's law require, laws require, the administration is abrogating your authority to set limits on immigrant entries and creating new pathways by which other aliens may enter, including by turning the CBP-1 app from a tool to facilitate lawful entries into the country to a means by which inadmissible aliens can schedule when and where they will enter the country illegally. The administration contends that those aliens are seeking to enter illegally, which we heard uh, in the opening statements, but that contention is legally and factually false. Regardless of whether inadmissible aliens cross between the ports or through them, the law requires that they be treated exactly the same and mandates their detention. Instead of detaining those aliens, however, the administration has released at least 2.2 million of them into the country, added some 1.5 million others who evaded apprehension, and more than 3.7 million aliens with no right to enter are now living and working in the United States. That's larger than the population of five congressional districts, or more people that live in Connecticut, the 29th largest state. If all the unaccompanied alien children who have been waived into the country were in one school district, it would be the sixth largest in the nation, and that does not include all of the children who came with adults in so-called family units. Schools will struggle to provide the children with even the most basic of education, and every student's education will suffer. Nearly all those migrants, adults and children, come with little or nothing and with few skills and little schooling, meaning they'll disproportionately draw on state, local and federal resources for support. Few of any will have health insurance and will rely on already strained emergency rooms and clinics for even the most basic forms of primary care. Even if the well-off here benefit from cheaper goods and services, those benefits are outweighed by the costs that are imposed on those Americans, both citizens and legal aliens, already struggling economically, who will fall farther behind. This is not a Biden versus Trump issue. No other president in history, not Presidents Clinton, Bush, or Obama, has ever placed the interests of those with no right to come to this country ahead of the well-being and security of the American people. As Barbara Jordan, civil rights icon, congresswoman, and chairman of President Clinton's Commission on Immigration Reform predicted nearly 30 years ago, that's destroying our national interest in legal immigration, as increasing numbers of Americans want to see cuts in the number of immigrants admitted lawfully every year. And none of that even touches on the harm to the migrants themselves. More than two-thirds are violently assaulted on the way here, and nearly a third of uh, female migrants are sexually assaulted. The children who are used by adults and smugglers alike as pawns to ensure quick releases, are all traumatized. The Biden administration has made a choice at the Southwest border to ignore the laws Congress has written. And the only ones benefiting are the smugglers and the cartels, rapacious and greedy criminals. By any definition, that's a bad choice and a worse deal for the American people and the rule of law. Thank you again for the invitation, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Sheriff Daniels. Well, good afternoon. Oops, oh, that's loud. Well, good afternoon, Chairman Grothman, Chairman Biggs, and all the honorable members of both subcommittees. On behalf of the citizens of Cochise County and the state of Arizona, a special welcome to Cochise County. I have served our border communities for 39 years, and prior to that, as a proud member of our military, serving at Fort Huachuca here, right here in Cochise County. I've always been a general, genuine believer in my oath of office to protect my country and now my county as the duly elected sheriff for the last 11 years. I'm the past president of the Arizona Sheriff Association, chair of the National Sheriff Association Border Security on the executive board for Western State Sheriffs and Southwest Border. All my associations share three objectives, public safety, national security, and humanitarian. In my submitted brief, I've shared with you all the overview of Cochise County and the history of our border. I have personally experienced the good, the bad and the ugly of being a border county. My office had always addressed border-related crimes, smuggling of both illicit drugs, human, weapons, and cash by our transnational organizations, i.e. the criminal cartels. I am proud of our relationships with our lo local, uh, state, and federal law enforcement partners that serve our communities. But I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you to our Customs and Border Patrol officers and agents who have worked tirelessly and honorably to protect this great nation. To best understand my presentation is to understand where we were over three years ago. My county was one of the safest border counties based on the collective governmental efforts, messaging, and yes, enforcement efforts supported by the rule of law. The direct impact on my county in this office, my citizens and law enforcement addressed mostly gotaways, fight and flight in my county versus those giving up. 
100% camouflaged migrants being illegally smuggled by the cartels at a price tag that begins around $7,000 and up. These smugglers include juveniles being recruited via social media by the criminal cartels. Border-related detention costs over the last 18 months is well over $6 million absorbed by my local and state taxpayers. Border-related crime is at an all-time high. Death, murder investigations, aggravated, aggravated acts against my citizens, failure to yields, search and rescue to include recovery, and yes, assaults against law enforcement officials. My deputies, law enforcement uh, officials continue to be placed in life-threatening scenarios as the car cartels show no regard for my citizens and those that wear a badge. Agents, troopers, deputies, and others are addressing dangerous scenarios, criminals as a direct result of an open border exploited by these criminal cartels for violence, fear, and greed. In calendar year 2022, we had 1,578 suspects were booked in my jail for border-related crime. Out of the 1,578, 78 were foreign-born and we had over 600 victims of felony crimes. In calendar year 2023, in just a little over five months, we had 683 suspects booked for in my jail for border-related crimes, 53 were foreign-born. This included 121 failure to yield pursuits and 180 smuggler drivers. Fentanyl continues to poison and kill Americans at an alarming rate, leaving families and communities devastated. Arizona efforts by law enforcement are remarkable, but the war on drugs must be priority topic and not deserted by a political rhetoric. Arizona fentanyl pills seizures accounts for an estimated 51% of all fentanyl seized in the country here in Arizona. Last year, 2022, Arizona seized over 60 million fentanyl pills. In closing, my fellow sheriffs and I have tried to partner with this administration to include the President of the United States with, with high hopes to share a collective message, collective action uh, plan, support the rule of law, prioritize our southern border, and provide updates, reference community impacts and concerns with little to no success. Thank you for being here for that. By allowing our border security mission and immigration laws to be discretionary, these criminal cartels continue to be the true winners. Their exploitation of mankind is simply modern-day slavery, allowing thousands of pounds of illicit drugs into our country that continue to erode the core values of families, schools, and subsequently killing Americans on an average of 290 every day. It's completely unacceptable at, all, at any level. Experiencing migrant deaths without reasonable process by, Congress of our, by members of our U.S. Congress and this administration intentionally avoids reality is gross negligence. Our voice of reason has been buried during what I call intellectual avoidance by this administration, yes, members of U.S. Congress. Communities have, neglected and, communities have been neglected and abandoned, relying on their own local and state resources to address a border that is in a crisis mode. Our southern border, against all public comfort statements out of Washington, D.C., is in the worst shape I've ever seen it. When one looks at public safety, national security, and humanitarian, our southern border is the largest crime scene in the country. The morale of agents is extremely low, and the collective frustration is very high amongst law enforcement at all levels, and most important, our citizens. With the recent cancellation of Title 42, this only serves to complex a border that needs immediate immigration reform by U.S. Congress, but most important, needs to be secured. I'm a true believer that Customs and Border Patrol are the experts of border security, while sheriffs and police chiefs are the experts of community. Together, this is a recipe of success for all our communities. I will leave you with this final statement. We all serve the priorities of Americans based on our shared oath of offices to keep them safe, enhance their quality of life and support the rule of law, absent political affiliation and the concern of re-election. I ask each one of you to reflect on this statement as you make your next decision to vote. Once again, I thank you, I thank you and this committee for the invite and the opportunity and now stand ready to answer any questions by, me by uh, members. Thank you. Thank you much, Sheriff. Mr. Ladd. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me. Um, I'm a fourth generation cattle rancher. My family's been on the same location for over 100 years, I got involved in the border over trespass cattle from Mexico, and it's evolved into being against illegal immigration. But the, the benefit of my involvement as well as Dr. Gary Thrasher, who's a vet here, Sonora has got a better clean a bill of health on their cattle than we do in Arizona. So that's been a plus for cattle. Uh, it, and without any sarcasm or anything else, I have the Donald Trump wall. I've got Obama's wall. And when they open the floodgates every summer to allow the flood water to come through, it has defeated the purpose of trespass cattle as well as people. And, and that's the irony of the whole border. Uh, every time we've had something good coming from CBP, 
uh, somebody in anybody's administration shuts it down. Uh, it, it looks to me like it's a deliberate process. Uh, Border Patrol's caught a half a million people at least on our ranch in the last 30 years. Uh, I've got camera towers. I've got 13, 18-foot wall, 30-foot wall, radar. And now we don't have the manpower. So there's always some little hitch that will not let the border be controlled. The only thing that's worked for me is Sheriff Daniels and Cochise County Sheriff Department with his Saber team program. He started out with five deputies and a handful of cameras. He had the, the will to implement it. He had the intel, the apprehension, and the county attorney prosecuted it. We haven't had drugs on our ranch for almost six years because of the sheriff. Uh, that sums it up. He had the will had the people that would do it, but he did it for a fraction of the cost. Uh, so I appreciate you being here, and, and I'm not giving up, but I spend 50% of my time fixing fences, broken water lines, and getting cattle off the highway. Um, I can't get any of this. The ADOT does a fairly good job trying to fix fences on the highway, but none of the other agencies ever look at the damages caused to Cochise County by illegal immigration. Border Patrol at this point, we have about a third of the agents that we normally have patrolling. I, my hat's off to them, but they're getting worn out, and none of them are going to go past a 20-year career. They're done. And that's the sad part of America, is Border Patrol is our front line to defend our borders. And it, it is not happening, and it's a lie coming out of Washington. Um, I don't see anything happening till the next administration. During Trump's administration, we probably had 10 illegals a week on our ranch uh, before Biden even took office with his promise to give amnesty to 11 million people. They started coming. And they're not bashful about what they're doing. I don't have any control over it. I don't uh, stop them or don't try and do anything other than call the sheriff for Border Patrol. But they own the whole country on the border, and you can get anybody and anything across that border whenever you want to do it. And, and that's been going on for 20 years. Um, we live it. I got grandkids living it. Uh, we're used to it. That's the sad part about it. We're not scared, but we're used to it. And, you know, don't come around our house unless we know who you are. But what are we going to do? Uh, I don't think the border will ever be the same, no matter how good it gets from this point forward. The border is never going to be the same. And that's my problem. They come through me every day, and they go live with you. You want to go through that with having people that don't speak English next to you. Your school systems are ruined. Your hospital systems are ruined. And your welfare is ruined. Uh, it, the, America is nowhere near what it was when I grew up. So... Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Arthur. You testified that the, uh, the Biden administration's claim that the southwest border uh, is safe, orderly, and humane, the way you describe it, uh, is not accurate. Can you give us some examples or why you feel that way? Why you would not describe it as safe, orderly, and, and humane? Mr. Chairman, uh, with respect to safety, uh, we've seen the number of migrant deaths spike. Uh, a couple of years ago, actually I think in 2022, we had 835 bodies found along the southwest border. Anybody who goes... Say that uh, again, because I, I want a lot of people to know that, including the press. Uh, how many people die just trying to come here? So we know that we found 835 bodies on our, on, side of the border. on our side of the border. We'll never know how many people have died on the Mexican side of the border. There are U.N. estimates about things like that. But anybody who has ever gone into the wilds of the Sonoran Desert or into South Texas knows uh, that it's not uncommon for individuals to find corpses years after the fact uh, in the brush. People simply get lost. They fall into distress. They die. With respect to orderly, uh, you know, we've seen a uh, diminishment for a couple of months after the Biden administration implemented some of its new ideas. 
But that uh, is spiked up. Uh, preliminary reports indicate that 130,000 people entered the United States illegally. Anybody who goes to the southwest border and, you know, looks at the crossers know there's nothing orderly about it. There's nothing legal about it. Um, it's sort of odd that this passes without notice. Many people will say, oh, you know, people who come through the ports are doing it the right way. It's not. We changed the law. You'd rather change the law back in 1996 to make, uh, to change the law so that individuals who come illegally through the ports and individuals who cross the border illegally are treated exactly the same in the law. There's nothing legal about this. And respectfully, sir, as a former congressional staffer and as a lawyer, it's offensive to me to hear people talk about the law and misstate the law in that manner. Okay. Next question. Did you say before a third of the women who make the trek here wind up being molested? Doctors Without Borders did a report back in 2017, I think it was, in which they indicated, I think the actual uh, percentage was 31 percent. I said nearly a third of all of them. A significant number of men are sexually molested on the way to the United States, and a not insignificant uh, percentage are actually shot on their way to the United States. Okay. Now, sometimes this jargon, people here in the audience might not, not know what you mean. You have a graph in your testimony talking about the number of gotaways who came here. I want you to explain briefly what the difference between a gotaway is and somebody who turns himself at the border, and then confirm if what this says is accurate. It looks like until the Biden administration took over, the number of gotaways, that is to say people who the Border Patrol did not touch and just came in here, looks like it was around 120,000. And now, in the most recent year in which you have full data, it's over 600,000. So we've gone up by a factor of five to one on the type of people we're not even touching. Is that accurate? I'm reading that right? You are reading that correctly, and the definition of Godaway actually appears in the uh, National Defense Authorization Act of 2017. It's now codified at 6 U.S.C. Uh, 223 for individuals that uh, CBP knows have entered the United States legally but not been apprehended. Uh, more than a half million in the last two years, almost 600,000 in FY 2022. Okay. Sheriff Daniels, you said something that kind of struck me. Um, the uh, the people that, you know, you have jails, obviously, sheriff's size, have to run the local jail. Does, does this uh, uh, flow of people coming across the southern border, does this affect uh, the amount of money you've got to spend on jail? Oh, it does. If you look at just in the first five months of this calendar year, 683 people were booked in my jail for border-related offenses. Uh, that 683, 621 were felony. Cochise County Attorney's Office has six felony attorneys to include the county attorney himself. Uh, they have record number of uh, prosecutions going on. I, I commend our county attorney, but that enhances our jail time, it enhances the prosecution time and investigation time, so it's a big burden on us. I, I want to ask you that many felons. You know, one of the things we hear when I get around my district, sometimes people say, oh, these are all such wonderful people, they'd never break the law, blah, blah, blah. Uh, do you find that true that they would never break the law? Well, let me, let me uh, summarize by saying this, Mr. Chairman, is what we see in Cochise County as part of the Tucson sector is fight and flight. For the most part, we lead the nation in the Tucson sector for gotaways. These are people that are aggravated deportees, whether based on criminal records um, of some sort or countries of interest that are being uh, smuggled by the criminal cartels through our county, uh, which places my law enforcement and my citizens at risk. That's why we prioritized our efforts to secure the border along with our border pro partners and keep our community safe. Okay, just one other question before I let you go. Um, one of the things I always wonder about is um, given, given the severity of the crimes you're, you're describing now, have things changed over the last five years? Can you tell me how you, 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 view, you view, the, view the world today compared to if we had this hearing five years ago? Well. Four years ago, I was bragging during presentations around the country to include my own state and my own community that we had collectively made Cochise County one of the safest places on the uh, southwest border. C the cartels did not want to play in our backyard because we were ready for them collectively. I can't say that honestly to my citizens today or those when I present. We've seen the, what I call the new normal of border, and that is the fact that crime is rampant as a result of border um, crime all the way up to murder and we've lost citizens in this county and we've lost people in this county that die at the hand of the cartels who don't care. Uh, I do care. 
Okay. Uh, now, so you understand how this normally works. Normally, each congressman up here gets uh, five minutes to question. I'm going to call on uh, Congressman Biggs in a second. But since I see we have no Democrats here, we're going to give everybody two chances to ask five minutes of questions. Okay, uh, Congressman Biggs. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. Um, let's start with Mr. Arthur. Just real quickly, the number of na nations represented in the cohort of people illegally entering the country this year? Pretty much every nation on the face of the earth, you'll hear numbers running from 150 to 186 uh, different nationalities. We've gotten people from Nepal to Nigeria to Nicaragua, including Guadeloupe, which technically is the Department of France, is as much as uh, France as Paris is. Uh, so yeah, we the, the door is wide open to anybody in the world to come here. And Sheriff Daniels, let's talk real quickly. What is the actual dollar amount you have had to incur to incarcerate um, criminal illegal aliens? We have, a, we have a captain. Am I on? We have a captain for the sheriff's office that uh, addresses all our grant and pro special programs to include this billing and oversight. He told me just this week that we just put a bill in uh, over the last 18 months, which is over $6 million for border-related incarceration costs. And thanks to the state of Arizona, people like uh, Representative Griffin and others that have support support us down here. Otherwise, we'd be in trouble. You have a number of high-speed chases that you've encountered in Sierra Vista, and I believe the range is two to ten on a daily basis on average. Is that right? Yes, we had just just the ones we got our hands on that we didn't disengage for community risk or for other reasons. We had 121 people booked in our jail just for failure to yield slash pursuits in five months. In, in five months, 121 in five months. And so some of these have resulted in severe fatality crashes or severe injury crashes. So not only do you have the incarceration costs, you have the enforcement costs. You, there, this community is enduring medical costs. And the mayor indicated to me uh, earlier today that on occasion the hospital has actually had been unable to take new uh, ad admittances because of the dealing of dealing with the illegal aliens and the uh, the health issues that they might have or accidents caused by them. One of the biggest risks is the lack of respect or, uh, or order by these criminal cartels. Uh, as stated earlier, majority of people we see from all of the United States via social media come here to pick up for smuggling purpose due to the fact it's, it's very lucrative. It ranges from $1,500 to $2,500 per person to drive them from Cochise County to Phoenix, Arizona, or Maricopa County area, you pick up four or five, you can see the numbers adding up very quickly. But the cartels tell, the driver, tell these drivers, who a lot of them have criminal backgrounds, to just speed, just go as fast as you can, get out of Cochise County. That place is, again, my citizens and uh, harm's way, which has become terrorizing when they see red and blue lights. The message here in Cochise County, if you see them, pull over right away, but just for your own safety. It's uh, not a good situation. Let's go back to you, Mr. Arthur, for just a second. Yuma Hospital reported to me last year, over about an eight-month period, they had lost almost $25 million in uncompensated care due to illegal aliens who'd come in and use their ED, their um, uh, emergency department, and also that they were averaging five uh, illegal aliens uh, in the maternity ward on a daily basis. Can you expand on, on what that's done to communities across the country, particularly border communities? By the way, I'll just add that when I was in Eagle Pass last week, I was told that they, they just like here, they have times that their hospital is close to new ad admittances from the local community because they're dealing with illegal aliens that are in the hospital. So tell me what, what we see nationwide. So it's important to keep in mind that right now we're seeing uh, what Yale News, I think back in September 2022, called a crisis in emergency departments. We, you know, we think of them as emergency rooms, hospitals deem them emergency departments. And that uh, many of them were reaching peach, 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 peak? peak capacity. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one of the things that they mentioned in the article was, that when uh, those EDs reach 85% capacity, the average wait time is more than six hours for people to get through. Um, most of the people who come to the United States, as I mentioned in my opener, don't have health insurance. And we know from various sources, including the National Institutes of Health, that uh, uh, unauthorized immigrants in the United States disproportionately use emergency departments for primary care. They just don't really have another option under federal law 
EDs have to take everybody that comes in, whether they can pay or not, or whether they have insurance or not. That's probably going to be the next thing, almost definitely going to be the next thing uh, that we're going to see in communities across the country. Those EDs are going to become more and more strained. It's going to be harder uh, for people to take sick kids, sick relatives themselves to the uh, EDs and get treated in a timely manner. We're going to have to do something in Congress about modifying MTAL. And last question real quick, Mr. Ladd. Um, I just want to know how law enforcement, you touched on this, the local law enforcement is actually kind of stepped into the breach of a vacuum but because of the overwhelming, um, uh, overwhelming nature of this that CBP has not been able to uh, respond to. What has been the distinction uh, when you have enforcement on your property and versus when you don't have enforcement? Well, the, the Biden administration has threatened our sheriff department. They can't do anything on the Roosevelt easement or any of the apprehensions. But the state law with the, the drug, carrying drugs, the sheriff can absolutely apprehend them. But it, it, when the Border Patrol is depending on our sheriff department's program for their intel, uh, it, it, that says it all. Uh, it, and Tim Williams talked earlier this morning about the, I think I've got $250 million of Homeland Security infrastructure on our ranch, including the wall. And, and the sheriff has done his program for one or two million dollars and five deputies. I, that sums up the, the whole hypocrisy of what Homeland Security is doing on the border. Thank you. My time's well expired. Yield back. Thank you. Mr. Timmons. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, first, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. And I have learned a, a great deal on my trip to Arizona, and I appreciate the witnesses for coming forward today to testify and help us really understand this challenge and try to find a path forward. I, I think the best thing to do is to just kind of go over how we got here. Um, you know, 30 months ago, our border was as secure as it has ever been. Uh, through diplomacy, Mexico agreed to create a National Guard and station 28,000 soldiers along their side of our shared border. Migrants that sought asylum waited in Mexico as their applications were processed. Our federal government was working hard to finish securing our southern border using both physical barriers as well as technology. And I, I think this is the most important part. Um, these policies that were being pursued by the Trump administration were mostly a continuation of Obama administration policies. It's not partisan, or at the very least, it shouldn't be. So what happened? Um, Biden administration, first week, they signed executive orders ending all of this. They stopped construction of the border wall, leaving hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, wasted taxpayer dollars along our border in miles of wall that has not been finished. Uh, they immediately ended the Remain in Mexico policy, and they allowed the Mexican National Guard to vacate their post. Um, and what did that result in? What was the, the result of their actions? Since January 21, there have been almost 7 million enforcement actions. Um, 3.4 million of those have been allowed to stay. So again, during the Biden administration, 3.4 million uh, people have been allowed to stay in this country. That is more than the population of 20 states in the United States. It's more than the population of 20 states in the United States. Um, if the influx of illegal immigrants is not enough, just this past year, we've seen 160 million fentanyl pills. 24% of those cross the border right here in Cochise County. That translates to tens of thousands of deaths, if not hundreds of thousands of overdose deaths. Um, on top of that, you have Democrat mayors. Uh, in some of our largest cities who are experiencing crisis after crisis because tens of thousands of these people that have been entering this country, of the 3.4 million people that have been allowed to stay, they don't have the resources, they don't have the infrastructure to deal with all of this stuff. So, Mr. Arthur, my question to you is why? Why has the Biden administration done this? It's very clear what has caused this. It's very clear that we have a problem. Why have they done this? Uh, Congressman, that's probably the, uh, the biggest question that I get, and I don't know, because they don't say. Um, they pit this as a, you know, Trump did this thing, Trump was bad, and, you know, we're going to be good. We're going to do the opposite. But, you know, as I mentioned, I served from presidents beginning in uh, George H.W. Bush. I was a uh, direct advisor, personal advisor to Attorney General Janet Reno. None of them would have done this. 
The Biden administration has removed all deterrence to individuals entering the United States illegally. No presidency in history has ever done that. And in many instances, they've actually signaled that they should come, that they need to come. And that's just wild to me. Sheriff Daniels, when we were uh, touring the border with you and your deputies earlier, they mentioned that the, the original height of the wall was increased to 30 feet under the Obama administration. Is that correct? Under President Obama, he had actually done a remodel on the existing border and raised it to over 30 feet, correct? And so the Trump administration continued the Obama administration policies to secure our southern border. And this president, our current president, I don't understand. I think personally that he is attempting to exacerbate the problem to facilitate another by compre comprehensive immigration reform. And, you know, th they attempted to do a lot of things in, in the Obama administration that I believe were illegal, but they uh, originally said they didn't have the legal authority, the constitutional authority to implement certain programs. And then they, at the end of it, he said, well, if Congress isn't, isn't going to do it, we'll do it. I think this is a continuation of that effort to try to make this um, such a crisis that Congress will act. And I'll be honest with you, we need to act. We need to secure our border. We need to secure our population. Um, hundreds of thousands of people are dying from drug overdoses. Millions and millions of people are entering this country illegally. We have a massive problem. Uh, we're trying to grow our economy. Every person that comes to me from my district that has a business says that they have a workforce challenge. These people aren't going to work uh, in our factories and our businesses. Um, they're in a shadow economy, and it's not good for them. It's not good for anybody. And um, we need to put a stop to this. Um, I will use my other five minutes to add additional questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To all of our witnesses, uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Sheriff. How, you were mentioning to us in your earlier testimony uh, about gotaways. Can you tell us how do you know uh, how many folks got away? What vehicle do you use to observe or, or, or measure gotaways? Uh, Congressman, yes. We use two methods here in Cochise County and the state of Arizona. Currently, we have a virtual camera system that runs the whole state of Arizona and parts of New Mexico that's monitored 24-7 through my office. We use our statistical data uh, and compare that with our Border Patrol partners to ensure that we have accurate numbers on gotaways. Gotaways are defined as people that are seen on cameras that are never apprehended. The other aspect on the CBP side, one of the tools they use is the aerostats, uh, commonly known as a blimp. Um, I was told this year that out of the 13 blimps, they were coming down at the end of this fiscal year, which is next month. The um, there's only four left, from my understanding, one being here in Cochise County. That The sophistication of camera equipment on those uh, aerostats is one of the main ways of counting the gotaways. Now, I can surmise and say the fact that when those four come down, what are we going to be using on the federal side to count gotaways? I predict those numbers will go down drastically. I've asked in D.C., I asked what the replacement of those aerostats would be, and they said they haven't developed the technology for that yet. So. And so what is your understanding would be the reason in taking those aerostats down? Well, one thing I continue to say and continue to hear, and sadly I have to say it, is the fact that the numbers are an illusion. I call them non-political numbers if they're reported accurately. But number two is it's a shell game. It's a shell game. It's a word game to make the American feel, people feel safe. When we know here at the community level, especially here in Cochise County, that that's not the, that's that's a false narrative. I would also say this, and uh, in my travels, uh, part of national sheriffs as border chair, I deal with all the way up to the chief of border patrol and many others. I have yet to have one tell me that the border is secure. Those who wear a badge from the federal government. Sheriff, have you met with President Biden and discussed your concerns? We have attempted on behalf of national sheriffs, western sheriffs, major county sheriffs, and southwest border sheriffs. I was told during a recent summit here in Cochise County and beyond, as sheriffs came together to find reasonable and um, balanced methods to secure our border, secure our communities who we represent, I was told that President Biden is the first president in history um, that we has never met with one of America's sheriffs. And so, to your knowledge, President Biden's not met with any sheriff in America to talk about border security. Uh, I just got back from another uh, meeting in Florida with sheriffs, and to the best of my knowledge, he still has not met with 
uh, any sheriff in America. Has anyone in the administration given you any encouragement or told you that they were behind the, uh, the sheriffs in, in America to partner with dealing with this crisis? To answer that question, Congressman, the answer is no. I will caveat that with this. Uh, on the onset, uh, myself and about a dozen selected sheriffs that are very engaged from the urban areas to rural areas to the southwest border to the interior met with Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, I actually personally hand carried him a 16-point collective plan to secure our border that was put together by sheriffs around the country to include my border committee at national level. Uh, three months later, I had heard nothing. Approximately three months later, I asked him where that plan was. He had a chance to review it to see if we can have some collective thinking or compromise. He asked me what plan did I give him. So that's the last I've heard on that. What can Congress do to help you and the other sheriffs address this border crisis? I would ask all Congress members to, uh, first of all, set aside the politics. This is not a political issue. This is a public safety, national security, and humanitarian issue. I've said this, and I need to, I'll say it again. Once we set the politics aside and look at the political reality, or excuse me, the, the, um, the, the, the community reality of what's going on, we need to prioritize and identify the issue of our border, all our borders. We need to share a message, local, state, and federal, on what the border means and what we need to do with it, we need, which is enforce the rule of law based on actionable consequences. We need enhanced judicial oversight on our border which if you put that in comparison, if I took all the judges out of Cochise County, when we arrest them, have to see them the next day, the, uh, the judges see our incarceration folks and there's no judge, they're automatically dismissed and released. And that's what's happening on our border and uh, together we can move forward. But until the politics is removed and people get their head out of the sand, we, we, could, uh, we, we gotta get that done before we can move forward. Sheriff, do you think that uh, this is a political stunt in, in what you see today? Do you, do you see this committee behaving in a political way? I've had the opportunity, obviously, uh, uh, Congressman Biggs and Cisco Monte, I've worked with uh, being our own congressman from Arizona, but the other three I have not met with you until today. I, I will say this, uh, I applaud you all for coming here because you show the respect toward our community and you made it actionable by being here and listening to us, not just me, but others and people in the community with the round table with some folks this morning. I don't think this is political. People, will, people like to use that word because it's cheap, but the reality is I applaud you all for being here and just listening to what we have to say. And the people in the room that are here supporting, thank them too. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I yield. Mr. Siskamani. Thank you, uh, Chairman Grotham, for, um, for being here and for the opportunity to wave into the committee. Thank you also, Chairman Biggs, for the joint session here today. It's uh, my privilege to be able to speak on, on, this, uh, on this hearing, obviously because I'm, uh, I work here, I work for you all, and we've been working on this issue now for the seven months that, that we've been in office and even before. And I have to tell you that this is not trending in the right direction, and we've seen that through the numbers. That's not just an opinion. It's really what has been happening. So I do want to thank uh, Sheriff Daniels and um, uh, Mr. Ladd as well, and, of course, Mr. Arthur for testifying here today and being, um, and being here with us to give us your expertise and your thoughts on this. And... You know, when I when I look at what's what's really uh, happening here, and I and we got the report today, and I do want to give up a, a good shout out to uh, the local leadership and the Saber team uh, that that is working on this, that has been working on this, and all the people here in this hearing that have been dealing with this issue for some time now. And we've seen the comparisons from two, three years ago, where we were and where we are today. And again, things are not trending in in the right direction. Haven't been for a while, but the local leadership here, city, county state and we've named uh, many of them here have done all that they can and all that you can to to help with this issue bottom line this is a federal issue and the federal government needs to step up to the plate on this and that's exactly what we're here to do and we also talked about the bipartisanship on this when I when we talk about city uh, county and state priority on this that crosses party lines and sheriff you just mentioned it uh, public safety national security and humanitarian these are the three factors of of what we're seeing here today in this uh, Tucson sector in Sierra Vista and Cochise County specifically are ground zero for this. And, and uh, the, the questions that, that I'm, I want to pose here to 
uh, some of you are, are specific in, in that area, and I'll take the opportunity to mention some of the things that we've been working on already, but this has been a priority for us, for you all, because you're living it day in, day out. You live this every single day. You, you, you know, uh, I, I really respect and, and uh, I'm grateful for uh, our colleagues here from other parts of the country coming here and seeing firsthand what's happening because you really have to see it in order to understand it, in order to believe it many times and see what's exactly happening. And that's what we did today. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, Sheriff Daniels, I'll start with you. Could you please speak to the tactics that you're seeing that the cartels use now to recruit young people? The biggest ta tactic, and it's no secret, um, is social media. Uh, teenagers today spend a lot of time on social media. We know that. It's no secret. And that's why we see children from the ages of 13 to 17, and then we've had them all the way up to 72 years of age, coming from all over the country. And you look at the almost 2,300 I stated earlier in my opening statement, only 131 were foreign born or illegally in the country. Mm -hmm. The rest were all U.S. citizens coming from Florida, Chicago, two former law enforcement officers. I had the, the privilege of addressing one of them. Um, you didn't like the consequences, but I addressed it. The bottom line is this, as long as social media fails to govern that and control that, when you can buy fentanyl off social media for 10 bucks yeah. a pill and it delivers at your house, that, that's a social media drug dealer. There's no other way to put it. Absolutely. We have, we have terrible bad actors and cartels and organized crime pushing fentanyl, and they're recruiting with social media. Um, obviously, I, I, I'm a co-lead on the bill here that I, that I know that you know about combating cartels on social media act. This addresses that issue specifically to make sure that uh, these social media companies are communicating with law enforcement to be able to tackle this. When you talk about the, the age range here from 12 to 72, I, I have six kids myself. Uh, several in this in this age range, it's it's uh, it's scary for any parent. This is the kind of thing that keeps you up at night. Both mm -hmm. either your child falling to the addiction of these drugs being transferred or being recruited for the, this kind of activity. I've got several questions and I'm running out of time here, but I'll, I'll mend, uh, one more question here to you, uh, Sheriff, and then I'll move on to the next round. Uh, another issue that seems to be plaguing our communities, particularly here in Sierra Vista, is the high-speed chases that you've talked about as well through our communities. Can you speak to the authorities that, um, that you know, what's been happening there and, and, and how that's, this endangers our community, not only in highways, but also in residential areas? Well, the vehicle obviously is when they get hooked up by social media, they come to our county, they pick up along the highways out of the brush, they jump in the car, and then 100 miles an hour through. We have spent many, many hours of enhanced interdiction, many hours of policy rewrite, working with legal to make sure doing everything we can to protect our citizens and bring that high-speed pursuit to a, uh, a close. And I'll say something on that if I could, Congressman, on this is something that's not being told either is – when we see young people up to a seven-year-old stuff in the back of a vehicle and a driver going 100 miles an hour in the opposite lane of traffic at 9 o'clock at night, who's protecting that migrant? Yeah. I would say the federal government's not. We are. We're doing everything we can to safely bring these to a conclusion so we see no more death in this county because that's getting old. Thank you, sir. The federal government has clearly been failing at this um, drastically for years now, and uh, we, we have the right attention on it now. Uh, Chairman, I yield back. Back in the last campaign, um, I think President Biden promised to give illegal immigrants all the free medical care. Uh, could you comment on that? I, I mean, I've talked to Border Patrol agents uh, when I've come across here in the past. Uh, are people coming here at all for medical care, or is that an expense that the U.S. taxpayer has to uh, deal with? Yeah, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. As I mentioned before, uh, one of the uh, – uh, biggest issues that we have that we will face in years to come from this surge that we've seen in migrants uh, has been an increase in the number of unauthorized foreign nationals who are accessing the U.S. medical care system. Uh, people criticize it all the time but can certainly understand it. We have the best health care system in the world. Uh, I'm born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. Saudi sheiks come to Johns Hopkins get treatment. And the fact is that people will come to this country, attracted to this country by the opportunity to get free education, free health care. Yeah, I've heard they come here solely. There are people coming here solely for the medical care. I need. It would not surprise me. And in fact, when I was a young trial attorney, I had a case involving a woman from Ethiopia 
who would uh, fly to San Francisco on a tourist visa. She would go to the local charity hospital. She would give birth. She was pregnant. She would go down to the State Department office on Mission Street, get a visa or get a passport for her child and fly back. Uh, so, and uh, Chairman Biggs had mentioned the situation in Yuma. Yuba is very unique because it's very easy to access the United States across the Morelos Dam in what we call the Yuma Gap. Uh, and so consequently, women will show up uh, in uh, 38 to 40 weeks of uh, pregnancy. They will come across directly, which is part of the reason why there's such a high uh, uh, number of uh, migrants, recently apprehended migrants, showing up at the Yuma Hospital. Okay. Um, Sheriff Daniels, I know a lot of times this is perceived to be migrants coming here either from Mexico or or uh, Central America. Could you tell me where you've found migrants coming from, say, in the last year? We, we on the southwest border, I believe it was over 157 countries were uh, encroached upon our border last year on the southwest border. That's a lot of countries. We've seen them all the way up to Iraq in our county. In fact, to give you a story, we had two Iraqis walking on the east side of our county, uh, called in, we, we checked it out. Uh, they both said they were lost. Well, they weren't the typical, well, we see people that are lost in the desert. No, they weren't dressed for it. They didn't look like it, and they didn't look tired. But uh, their, their statement to us, they were legally in the country, but they were lost here, and they were from Iraq. Okay, you sometimes hear that the, uh, or I've heard the migrants are not necessarily poor. Do either one, any one of the three of you want to comment on that? There was a uh, situation uh, that... Uh, a senator from Oklahoma had actually observed uh, in Yuma uh, involving a woman who was uh, wearing a very fashionable outfit, and the staffer said, she's wearing Versace. And he was like, who's Versace? Uh, had no idea. They had to put a uh, weight limit on the amount of baggage that Border Patrol buses would carry from Yuma uh, to the Border Patrol Processing Center because people were bringing entire wardrobes of clothing. These are outliers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, but it's a real situation, and many of the people who are coming to this country are actually doing pretty well where they are. They just want to do better here. That's what I've heard. Um, we talked about, I was you or, or Sheriff Daniels talked about the number of migrants who are dying every year, and uh, at least when I was in the San Diego sector, we were told that more people were drowning on the Mexican side than the American side trying to come here. But is there a trend on the number of people dying trying to get here in this country? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yep. Hello, hello, there we go. Mr. Chairman, last year, due to the fact of death on our southwest border, uh, to include the deaths we're seeing here in Cochise County, the National Sheriff's Association, uh, we put out a, a sample photo album of all the migrants, as I believe it was over 1,300 died under this administration that had died of horrific deaths of exposure on U.S. soil that we sent to every sheriff in this country to bring awareness that sheriffs, get your head up and let's unite on this. And, um, but we're seeing historical numbers. I mean, I just saw a thing the other day where just the, with the amount of heat we're seeing on the southwest border and the amount of deaths we're seeing on that. So again, it's, it's inhumane to say the least. Okay, Mr. Ladd. Uh, final question for you. Uh, you're, you've obviously had your farm on the border for many, many years. Could you comment on the presence of the Border Patrol today compared to, again, say, three or four years ago? Oh, yeah. It, it's about 25% uh, of what we normally have. Um, the Brian Terry Station is somewhere around 400 agents typically, and Probably 200 of them are detailed out, and the rest of them are processing people. Uh, so they take it, they pull them off the border. And so, so you've seen what we have heard, and that is the sea of people coming here means so many of the Border Patrol agents who are Border Patrol agents because they like guarding the border are stuck doing paperwork because of this other sea of people. Is that, that, is that what you a, saw? Absolutely right. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before you uh, yeah. move on, if I could just uh, talk about a point that you had made, uh, and the Sheriff Daniels had made, about the large number of deaths. Deaths are sky high. Another thing that is sky high is Border Patrol searches and rescues. Border Patrol agents are literally saving tens of thousands of people 
exponentially higher numbers. I just feel that it's appropriate to bring that up. They will put their lives into danger uh, in the uh, Sonoran Desert, in the Rio Grande. Floods come up all of a sudden. Flash floods 100 miles down river will send water down. They will jump into that water to save children. Migrants will throw children into the water knowing that agents will go after those children and that uh, they'll be able to get, or uh, smugglers will do that, knowing that they'll be able to get back across the river. Right, so the American citizen has done a tremendous job here, putting gallons of water out in the middle of the desert, hoping people don't dehydrate. Congressman Biggs. Thank you, thanks Mr. Chairman. Sheriff Dennels, one of the things that seems consistent to me in your testimony is when we fail to enforce law, we fail to have deterrence effect and bad people do bad things. So. In that vacuum, um, I'm wondering if you can talk about how the policies and the failure to enforce the law has created a situation where we see um, increasing amounts of human trafficking. Well, when you look at the stats on, under this current administration compared to where we were in the past, we were, used to run between 5 and 10 percent when it comes to border crimes. Right now, we're seeing 40 to 44 percent increase in, in uh, our optics and operational tempo. So it's caused a huge increase for us. I, I will just say this, and I've said this before, and it's going to sound bad, but it comes out the way it is, is when these transnational organizations, the criminal cartels, have better operational plans criminal plans at that, and will in our current administration, obviously, no matter what policy you put in place, this administration has to prioritize and put will with sustained operational plans with secure policies that are, sustained policy is going to secure our border. Until we do that, in, in partnership with Congress, we you all got to work together, and I promise you, your state governors, your sheriffs around the country, your police chiefs will rally behind you on reasonable reasonable consequences and, uh, and laws. Mr. Arthur, um, we've touched lightly on parole policy, but in reality, this administration has changed the actual de facto implication of parole. Previously, um, numbers I was given was the high was a 24 um, because parole was meant to be particularized on a case-by-case -case individual basis. What has changing parole to um, be, quite frankly, this is being litigated, right? So what, is, what does it mean when, when uh, Secretary Mayorkas is talking about parole by categories? Uh, very briefly, parole is a very limited authority that Congress has given to DHS that allows, that enables them to allow an inadmissible alien into the United States. It can only be granted on a case-by-case uh, -case basis for significant uh, public benefit or urgent humanitarian reasons. For decades, those terms were defined uh, significant public benefit was uh, we had to have a criminal defendant come into trial. Uh, uh, urgent humanitarian reasons were emergency medical treatment. The Biden administration has used that authority to parole 1.437 million people into the United States. Basically, what they've done is they've taken that uh, 24 people a month. In fact, it was actually seven when uh, shortly before uh, Judge Weatherell in Florida versus United States uh, put the hammer down on Border Patrol agents releasing people on parole, Border Patrol, could, or, uh, Border Patrol leadership could uh, see the writing on the wall and seven people at the, the entire southwest border were paroled in the month of uh, February. That's how it should be. Uh, when you're talking about 1.437 million, it applies a pseudo-legal gloss to what is an inherently illegal system. Congress and, 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 actually amended the law in 96 in order to tighten the restrictions from the ones that I just mentioned, and the Biden administration is just blowing past those. And the result has been an, a pull factor or an incentive to come. That's, that's really how catch and release works now, is through a categorization of parole. That's correct, and uh, that was one of the points that Judge Weatherell made uh, in uh, his Florida decision was, the reason that people are coming is because they're getting in. Character, uh, uh, categorization of parole is a misnomer. You can't have a case-by-case -case categorization. And in fact, the Biden administration is using parole almost in a mirror image, because rather than case-by-case, -case, it's an entire group of people, not significant human, uh, uh, based on the limited factors, but we only keep out the people who, you know, 
don't meet our factors. This is nothing what Congress said it should be. Let's, let's shift and let's talk about New York where Mayor Adams is just beside himself because of the 93,000 illegal aliens that have come into his community vis-a-vis um, -vis the number that we've seen come through, let's say Yuma, 1,000 a month, uh, uh, or excuse me, 1,000 a day uh, and many, many days in, in Sierra Vista. Talk about the impact. So he has to deal with an impact of 93,000 uh, uh, illegal aliens there, schools. Just, let's just talk schools, for instance, in New York City. So uh, based upon reports that have been issued by the New York City Comptroller's Office, I determined that if 35,000 uh, illegal migrants relocated to New York, it would impose a cost of $440 million on the New York City public school system, just that one school district. Uh, we know that 93,000 uh, migrants have made their way to New York. Uh, Mayor Adams is asking for $4 billion to basically provide food and shelter and uh, medical services for those individuals. That doesn't even count the educational uh, part of that. But yeah, I mean, it's probably about $1.2 billion just in educational costs. But to break down uh, the cost that Mayor Adams is talking about, he wants $4 billion from the federal government to deal with his migrant issue. That works out to $471.14 per 8.9 million people living in New York. That's uh, 23 uh, $20 bills, one $10 bill, uh, a, a dime and four uh, pennies. This is a huge amount of money, uh, but these are the costs that are being posed on places all across the United States. Portland, Maine, I was there a few weeks back, is reeling uh, trying to deal with the problem. You talk to anybody on the streets, Denver, Colorado, these aren't border towns. Uh, I did an interview this morning with News Nation. And uh, the, uh, the anchor who was interviewing me finished it up with, every town's a border town, and that is true. So, Mr. Chairman, my, my time has long expired, but could I please be recognized for unanimous consent? Sure. Well, so, my unanimous consent, um, I ask that uh, uh, an article dated uh, two days ago, um, entitled 10,000 Migrants apprehended, apprehended One Week in Arizona Border Sector be admitted into the record as well as um, another piece called uh, from two days ago, three days ago called Apprehensions and Rescues Increase in Border Patrol Tucson Sector um, and, as well as I think, I think I'll, I'll just stay there for now if I'd ask to be admitted to the record. So ordered. Congressman Timmons. Famous Chairman. Um, I've been working on what I was going to ask for the last 20 minutes, and the fact that he started asking my questions at the end is a good sign. It's a good sign. Um, you know, we keep saying that this should not be a partisan issue, and I just want to expand on the fact that it really isn't partisan at all. Um, and I really want to begin by saying, who is the current situation even actually good for? Um, obviously, uh, Congressman Biggs just talked about New York, just yesterday, uh, Mayor Adams announced, uh, complained about the fact that he was going to have to turn Randall Island, which is a, a kid's soccer field, into a migrant shelter for 2,000 um, adult migrants. Two weeks ago, D.C. Mayor Bowser announced they spent $20 million this year on the migrant crisis. Um, even some of the most progressive uh, members of the D.C. City Council that have been ardently supportive of sanctuary cities um, have now said that uh, D.C. is a border town. Um, I mean, all of these people that have been pushing these pro-illegal immigration policies, these lawless policies at the southern border, they're now coming around to say, oh, this doesn't really work. And it doesn't just adversely impact um, border uh, counties and cities, it impacts the whole country. As you said, Mr. Arthur, every town is a border town. Um, on top of that, I, I mean, I know eight people that have died from a fentanyl overdose um, that I've met throughout the course of my life. And hundreds of thousands of people are dying from fentanyl overdoses, and they have families, and it's just a huge uh, tragedy of an epic proportion that is extremely preventable. It's extremely preventable. So if it's not good for the American people, if it's not good for even the most liberal cities who have been spouting this ultra-progressive nonsense for decades, if they're coming around, um, I think that it might 
be past time for the Biden administration to come around. But before we get to that, who is it good for? And uh, Sheriff Daniels, when we were meeting with your deputies, um, I think it's great for the cartels. Um, Y'all threw out the number 2.6 billion in revenue. Was that, what is the time that they had 2.6 billion in revenue? Is that annual? Annual number. That is an annual number. So the that's what they took home, by the way. That was after all that's cost. Net. Yeah, that's net. net. Yeah. I would love to see the accounting on all this. Um, but so we literally are allowing the lawlessness at our southern border, which I would argue is simply because the the previous administration is just so so hated by the current administration. Anything that they did, uh, anything the Trump administration did, it had to be undone immediately. And Americans are dying, um, our cities are overrun, and we do not have the infrastructure to address this. Um, our economy is suffering because our tax base doesn't support the institutions, doesn't support the hospitals, doesn't support uh, the schools, doesn't support the roads. I, we just really, really, really need to do something about this. And I hope that the Biden administration is gonna start listening as, um, their mayors in their major cities are sounding the alarm. Obviously, Sheriff Daniels, you've been sounding the alarm for years. And um, I spoke with uh, my law enforcement, my solicitor, my sheriff uh, this afternoon. This is a huge problem. We're, we're fighting it the best that we can, but we need to secure the southern border. We need to finish the wall. We need to add technology. Um, we need to reinstate Remain in Mexico. We need to get the Mexican government to redeploy the 28,000 guardsmen to secure their side of the border. We need to secure our side of the border, and we need to fix our immigration policy going forward because um, just it doesn't work, and people all over the world want to come to the United States to pursue the American dream, and they are denied that opportunity because all of the resources are being sucked to the illegal, illegal part of the equation, and the legal side does not have the resources to address the need. And by the way, our entire economy is suffering because of it. We have millions of jobs that need people that want to come here and work hard and pursue the American dream, raise their family, and they are denied that opportunity because this administration refuses to secure our southern border and re refuses to enforce the rule of law. And that is the message I send to the White House. That is the message I send to the president. Um, it is past time that we make changes, and I will do whatever I can in Congress to help uh, fix this problem. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Edwards? Mr. Arthur, uh, just, just very quickly, could you remind all of us, what is the original purpose of asylum? The original purpose of asylum is to ensure that individuals who have been persecuted on account of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion are not returned to, to that persecution. And so is it your observation that uh, that that purpose is being used as it's intended today, or is it in some way uh, being abused? Absolutely not. It's not being used in the manner that it should be. Uh, and very briefly, when you read interviews in the newspapers, you hear them uh, on the press, people are coming here because they're fleeing poverty, they're fleeing crime, uh, you know, they're looking for a better life. Th those are all, and I can understand that, and I can understand the instinct for doing that. None of those things are a basis for asylum. Right now, the Biden administration has admitted so many people into the United States that there are 1.4 million plus individuals currently applying for asylum in this country. Uh, Representative Biggs, uh, Mr. Chairman Biggs, had talked about uh, 84 months for people to be put into proceedings. It's actually much worse than that. Some of those people aren't even going to start the asylum process until 20, 20, 2032 uh, at the New York office. They're not even going to get into proceedings to begin the four-plus year process to apply for asylum. And that's bad in a couple of ways, uh, Mr. Edwards. One, uh, people who come here and make bogus claims are taking advantage of the humanitarian instincts of the American people and making it less likely that future people who truly need asylum are going to get it. Two, the more quickly that we can get asylum for an individual who truly deserves it, the more quickly that person is, one, going to be able to get their life in order here, but two, and more importantly, 
bring relatives back home who probably are either persecuted because of very similar claims or because of the relationship to the primary asylum applicant to this country. We want to we want to give people asylum as quickly as possible who deserve asylum. But right now there are so many people filing bogus, weak, or non-existent claims. It's gumming up the system. It's denying justice all around. And so I hear I, I think I hear you saying that there's a distinct difference between folks that are coming here for a better way of life and those folks that really are fearful of persecution for the reasons that you mentioned. Absolutely, and it's, it's ruining uh, the asylum system, sir. Right. Thank you. Sheriff, uh, have you seen an increase in unaccompanied minors uh, coming across the border? We don't see that here in Cochise County. What we see, is probably 80, 90 percent of what we see, congressmen, is single male adults, ages 20 to 30 years of age, very healthy, camouflaged from booty to headgear. We see very, very few children and females coming through Cochise County. But you do see children in America working to help cartels smuggle uh, Im immigrants across the border. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I believe last year, and again, top of my head here, I don't stab right in front of me. Last year, just in Cochise County, what we were addressing, we had over, I believe it was 89 to 100 juvenile drivers smuggling for the cartels that we took into custody and got our hands on. And how much do they earn to smuggle a body across the border? Unfortunately, that's another illusion. They advertise 2,500. A safe routes through Cochise County, easy money that's lucrative to these young kids, these vulnerable minds. And um, when they finally get to their destinations, it's always different, let's put it that way, what they actually get paid. But it's, for these young people, it's a lot of money. So who's advertising to these young people that they can make $2,500? The cartels, the and, criminal cartels. And what method are they using to advertise? Social media and all apps. And you, um, pretty much any social media app, the popular ones are all over there. Mr. Ladd, why is your property a, uh, a, a primary crossing point for illegal activity? Well, number one, there's a, a good infrastructure system in Mexico. We have a port of entry at the uh, Naco, Arizona, Naco, Sonora, and it's pretty easy terrain. And uh, originally, Border Patrol, I believe, deliberately put them into Cochise County thinking that they wouldn't uh, climb over the Huachuca Mountains or the Pelenseal Mountains to the east. So the, the terrain's too rough. But, uh, and then the Highway 92 is three miles from the border. So you got a three mile walk, you get loaded up, and you're gone. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being a part of this solution. I will, if I could add to who benefits from this, you, um, look at the NGOs that are getting subsidized for taking care of the illegals. They're making millions of dollars on a service that uh, I think is uh, corrupted, in my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Siscomani. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I ended the last round by saying that the federal government is failing, and I, I really stand by that. That means that they're failing everyone. I mean, they're failing all of you here uh, by not doing what needs to be done to protect. They're also failing our agents, though. They're fail failing our Border Patrol agents and those that are on the front line fighting hard and those in law enforcement to swell. And, and I would even venture to say that they're failing those that are seeking an opportunity of a better life in this country. They're, it, they're absolutely failing everyone. There's no win on this one for, for really anyone. One of the, in, in talking about our agents here, one of the main efforts, I, I came here shortly after starting my, my first term just a few months ago, and one of the first things I did was meet with, with our Border Patrol agents and law enforcement. We had a combined meeting. One of the things that I heard was a need to have to do something about making it illegal to, uh, for uh, making it a federal crime for, um, for evading law enforcement when they're fleeing. We talk about these high-speed chases. We need to tackle the root issue, which is, again, the social media aspect, but also increasing penalties on those that are fleeing uh, law enforcement, because right now it's not. And I think many of the people in the room were shocked, including myself, that it's not even a federal crime to do, to, uh, to do so. So that's one of the things that we've taken immediate action on. Now, Mr. Ladd, um, talking about um, penalties to those that are uh, breaking the law here, we talked about those uh, transporting people 
but but also on the spotter side. Uh, you you know, I visited your your ranch. I've been there several times, and uh, you've taken me around in several aspects of it. I got to see the the wall stacked up there that was there for a long time without being used. One of the other things you showed me was the activity that you can see on the other side, and the and the activity by these spotters. Because I also uh, um, have a, a bill here that will increase penalties for those people that are enabling and participating in the spotting system. Can you talk a little bit about the spotters, please? Well, that it's widespread on the whole border, and yeah, it's a uh, they got good optics. They're dedicated to they'll be at their outposts for two weeks at a time, and and they've got really good cell service, so they're in communication with the rest of the smuggling crew, and when they don't see law enforcement or border patrol, they go for it mm -hmm. and it, it, you know they're they're on my ranch they're in the the mountains above us it, we're out where we were this morning and nobody can touch them and even the, the mexican army won't touch them um, but but they know exactly what's going on they know how many people are on the border they know how many people they got crossing at any given time they stage it uh, example on our ranch is a, the first shift the border patrol in the morning they're going to catch three groups they're going to be tied up an hour and a half and while they're processing that group waiting for transport there's going to be five groups that go right past them exactly we, we've seen that and we th that's exactly what they're reporting as well i'm going to try to fit in two more points mr arthur uh real quick here you know you talked about the impact on the legal system here on the on the legal part of becoming uh, you know, a resident and eventually a citizen. I know that system well. I, I was born in Mexico, and I actually became a United States citizen in 2006. And then I became a U.S. congressman in 2022, 16 years later. This is the best country in the world. This country is a welcoming country. It's a country of loss as well, of, of, um, of being gracious and uh, being um, welcoming of so many people around the world. And I can tell you firsthand how many holes and things we need to fix on the legal side of becoming a United States citizen, given that I, my family got, and I got here years and years before. I got here as a young child, and it took us that long to be able to finally become U.S. citizens. Now, I know that firsthand because I went through it. I started as a child and became a citizen when I was an adult. So uh, on this impact that, that the illegal activity right now is having on the legal side of people that have been in the waiting list and on the, in line basically for so long, can you talk just briefly on that? And I want to get one more point in, if you may. Uh, absolutely. Uh, one, uh, the Gallup organization does uh, polling on uh, whether people want uh, impressions of uh, immigrants to the United States. That polling has taken a very dire turn, uh, and a plurality of Americans now want to see less legal immigration in the United States, which is bad. Uh, we want to, you know, continue to bring in the vibrancy to this country. But there are a couple of other aspects of that. Very briefly, uh, Mr. Siskamani. One is we have so many asylum uh, claims that are pending before the immigration court, before USCIS. A large number of people who want to bring their family to the United States, who want to come to the United States legally, their applications are stuck in that backlog. Yeah. They are truly suffering. At the ports, we have legitimate travelers who want to cross the border uh, into the United States. Right now, CBP-1, we've heard talked about, 1,450 interviews for, uh, per day, and you could show up any time during a 23-hour period. You can imagine what effect that's going to have on the ports on the other side and on the ability to stop the fentanyl that Mr. Timmons had talked about before. If you're pulling those agents off to talk to somebody who doesn't have any right to be here, you're going to slow up that system. Thank you. Um, I'm out of time. The last point I want to make is several of you mentioned, and I think it's important food for thought here for my, my colleagues on, um, uh, and also for everyone here. Several of, of everyone here brought up uh, the point of Mexico and their role in all this and how when they were cooperating uh, just a few years ago, things were a lot better. And the diplomacy needed here and also the them being our number one trading partner, living on the border like all of us do here, is an asset, not a liability. And it shouldn't be seen as a liability, but it's become one uh, in a lot of ways due to this lack of enforcement. So we need to continue to work, uh, and Mexico needs to work with us as well in order to live on their, you know, uh, 
uh, live up to their end of the, of the securing the border piece as well. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, again, once again, thank you so much for bringing the attention to the border and for bringing uh, both subcommittees here to uh, CD6 in Arizona. Thank you so much. Thanks to the witnesses as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Biggs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is, this is a closing statement. When I chair my committee in Congress in a solo fashion, I don't allow closing statements, but Chairman Grothman is one nice fella, and I, and I was surprised that he was gonna give me a closing statement. So I have a few, th few things that I wanna say. Somebody said, what can we do? I wanna address that. I wanna talk about what Congress can do when you are, have a slight majority in the House, the other side has a different majority in the Senate, and, and the White House seems to, to disagree with us on how, what to do with this issue. The first thing is the, the Constitution, the founders gave us the, the or, or, origination of the spending. That is what they gave to us as the first check. I implore, if, if people really believe this is the existential crisis that I think it is, and, and then you look at our spending, which is absolutely nutty crazy, then it is time to vary a laser-like focus on where you want the money spent, get rid of the crappy programs, and focus on where you want that money spent. And if they don't spend it to enforce the law, they they lose that funding. They should not be allowed to have that funding. And then at the same time, you make sure that the ICE uh, and that the Border Patrol and others enforcing uh, border law have the revenue they need, the sources they need. And that, that's step one. Second thing is you have hearings and transparency like this. Why is that? It is because everybody in this room, I think, at least has some recognition of the, uh, uh, the urgency of, of reaching a solution on this problem. But there are many in this country that do not. We had a hearing in judiciary two weeks ago. Everybody from the Northeast said, hey, there's no problem on the border. Um, even Mr. Nadler, who is from New York, for mercy's sake, where even Eric Adams is now frantic. You have to continue to elevate that. The third thing is we have something called the Holman Rule that allows us to go in and reorganize various aspects of, of departments and agencies that are failing to do their duty. That needs to be done at the highest levels of Department of Homeland Security. And that is also um, uh, goes hand in glove with another tool that the framers gave us the hold accountable elected or appointed officials within the executive branch, when, those, when you have officials in the executive branch that are public officials who have violated the public trust and we cannot wait till the next election to remove them from office and have them replaced, then we need to act. That's called impeachment. That is what needs to happen here, in my opinion, of Secretary Mayorkas. Additionally, specifically, let me give you an example on the funding. You must, we must stop funding the uh, non-government uh, non organizations that are actually facilitating it. Studies and reports have demonstrated that there are nine particular NGOs that are helping to fuel uh, this, this border crisis. They're getting people to come across. They're facilitating human trafficking. I think you have to use every congressional tool available. If you want to solve the problem, that's what you're going to have to do. You have to make sure that, uh, let's see, I've, I've hit everything else. Oh, you have to provide for support for local law enforcement. Look what's happened here. And I'll, I'll give you another example. So, so Sheriff Daniels in the Cochise County has done a great job trying to help out. I'll give you another example. In Texas, if you go down to the Texas border, Eagle Pass, what has happened there? It's not, it's not CBP because the, the, the leaders of CBP are not, are not helping enforce Eagle Pass. It is Texas Department of Public Safety that is trying to secure that. And so, so uh, the Supreme Court has held 
that when, when the federal government vacates the field, local, local jurisdictions can step in. Article 4, Section 4 makes it clear, in my opinion, that we have failed because it is our responsibility to make sure that no invasion takes place uh, in any state. That's what Article 4, Section 4 requires of the federal government. We have failed. The, just the sheer numbers. There has never been that kind of, of uh, incursion in any nation in, any, in the history of the United States, not the United States, in the world. In the world. It just has never happened. So, um, Mr. Grothman, the chairman, is probably uh, tired of hearing from me. He's, it's his fault. He gave me a closing statement. But I decided to just take advantage of it and just rant for a little minute. He didn't even tell me how much time I had. So, those are things I think we can do. We have to do them. We have to take action. I call upon these, these, these folks who showed up for the hearing today. I'm grateful for them. But I call on my other colleagues. Help us out. Yield. Thank you. Uh, I will agree with Mr. Biggs that this is the most important crisis facing America. Uh, today we heard testimony on a variety of facets of that crisis. The sheer volume of unvetted people coming from all around the world. The drugs coming across the border, over 100,000 people uh, dying every year. The cost, in med the medical cost to America and the school cost to America. And, uh, the humanitarian cost of people dying in the Rio Grande or dying in the desert or dying in the Pacific Ocean and the corrupting of our miners as they get dragged into uh, transporting these people. Uh, but in any event, I do feel this uh, hearing has highlighted the need for continued oversight of the Biden administration's policy. The Department of Homeland Security and their law enforcement partners have a huge issue to secure our borders. Our hardworking officers and agents and their partners in local communities cannot adequately defend the border and protect American communities if there is no desire in leadership in Washington. And let's face it, you know, you don't like to say it, they don't care. And they absolutely don't care how many people cross the border and how overworked the Border Patrol is, they don't care. Um, it, it, um, well, I think they care about changing America, but it's my hope that uh, being here in the Tucson sector and hearing from witnesses will shed light on President Biden's failed policies. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Biggs for doing all he has to set this up, as well as for his opening and even closing statement. And other members who joined us today, I'd like to thank you for coming all over the country. With that, and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit materials and to submit additional written questions for the witnesses, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. If there is no further business without objection, oh, and by the way, I'd like to thank the staff for coming halfway across the country and keeping us in line. Uh, if there are no further business without objection, the Joint Committee hearing stands adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>